Hello, ENG 4C. It is May 22nd, and we're coming at you with our class video of the day. So, first of all, an announcement. Uh, Monday is Eid, or, well, it's the second day of Eid, right? Uh, so, uh, even though I'm pretty sure all the prayers are shut down all around the city, uh, I won't be posting a video then, right? Because it's Eid, and I'm Muslim, so I'm going to be taking the day off, and you guys can take the day off, too. Uh, you'll have an extra day to wrap up short stories, so don't worry about that. So, Sherlock Holmes, let's get back to that. Uh, I hope you guys are, first of all, enjoying the story, right? It's meant to be a more fun story than the other two, right? I certainly think it's way better than the other two, right? But that's just me. I love these stories. So, yesterday I introduced this uh, story a bit, but I want to talk a little bit more about some of the details here, right? Uh, so, first, we talked about the crime, right? Which are the proofs for a Greek language test have been copied by a naughty, cheating student. So, if you were wondering, a proof in this case is essentially the answer key, right? So, if you take a proof, you're taking the answers to... Um, the questions, right? So typically these kinds of tests, even now, right? If you're learning something like Greek when you already know English, right? They'll give you a text of Greek, right? And they will say, all right, translate that into English, right? Uh, so that's uh, what has been stolen here, the proof from the language exam, right? So it would be like one of you stealing my laptop and copying all my stuff before the test, right? Very bad, don't do that. So, someone broke into the professor's office and copied the proofs with a pencil. We've got three suspects. Uh, first, you've got Gilcrest, right? Who's a good scholar and rugby athlete. Let me find his description here. Uh, oh, hold on. So, Gilcrest is uh, described on page four. As a fine scholar and athlete, uh, plays in the rugby team and the cricket team for the college, and got his blue for the hurdles and the long jump. He is a fine, manly fellow. His father was the notorious Sir Jabez Gilchrist, who ruined himself on the turf. My scholar has been left very poor, but he is hardworking and industrious. He will do well. Right? So you've got the good student as your number one. And then your number two is the second floor is inhabited by Dalit Ross, the Indian. He is quite quiet, inscrutable fellow, as most of those Indians are. Uh, he is well up in his work, though his Greek is his weak subject. He is steady and methodical. So just in case you're wondering, well, why is he talking like that about Indians? Right, Most of those Indians are, right? This would be during colonial times, right? So in 1895... Uh, India, as well as Pakistan, I could add, uh, were under the colonial rule, uh, imperialist rule of Britain, right? So this would have been uh, one of those students from India that came to Britain, right? So um, that's that's what's going on there. But you've got this Dalit Naras guy. Greek is his weak subject, but he studies hard. And then you've got a third guy, Miles McLaren. He is a brilliant fellow when he chooses to work, one of the brightest intellects of the university, but he is wayward, dissipated, and unprincipled. He was nearly expelled over a card scandal in his first year. Uh, he has been idling all his term, all this term, and he must look forward with dread to the examination, right? So those are our three uh, suspects here, right? So Gilchrist, Dalit Ross, and Miles McLaren, right? And this is how it usually works in uh, Sherlock Holmes stories, right? Where you'll have a couple of different people who could have done the crime, right? In this case, uh, Gilchrist, Dalit, and Miles. So you also have what's called a witness, right? Who is Bannister, right? So Bannister is there as... Um, you know, a servant, right? He works for the university. And we see that he gives what's called a testimony uh, to Sherlock Holmes, right? This is on the same page, page four, right? Right at the right column. 
So Bannister, he was a little white-faced, clean-shaven, grizzly-haired fellow of 50. He was still suffering from the sudden disturbance of the quiet routine of his life. His plump face was twitching with his nervousness, and his fingers could not keep still. We are investigating this unhappy business, Bannister, said his master. Yes, sir. I understand, said Holmes, that you left your key in the door. Yes, sir. Was it not very extraordinary that you should do this on the very day when there were these papers inside? It was most unfortunate, sir, but I have occasionally done the same thing at other times. When did you enter the room? It was half past four. That is Mr. Solmes' tea time. How long did you stay? When I saw that he was absent, I withdrew at once. Did you look at these papers on the table? No, sir, certainly not. How came you to leave the key in the door? I had the tea tray in my hand. I thought I would come back for the key. Then I forgot. Has the outer door a spring lock? No, sir. Then it was open all the time. Yes, sir. Anyone in the room could get out? Yes, sir. When Mr. Soames returned and called for you, you were very much disturbed? Yes, sir. Such a thing has never happened during the many years that I have been here. I nearly fainted, sir. So I understand. Where were you when you began to feel bad? Where was I, sir? Why, here, near the door. So, uh, what we're seeing there is what's called an interrogation, right? Where Sherlock Holmes is asking all of these little questions, looking for details, looking for uh, information that he can use to sort of piece this together, right? So uh, that's another typical feature of a Sherlock Holmes story, where you'll have this sort of back and forth with questions, right? And we don't know if Bannister is telling the truth or not. In fact, we don't know if anyone is telling the truth or not, right? All we know is that what he's telling Sherlock Holmes, right? So... That's uh, one way that Sherlock Holmes is going about this investigation. You'll also probably have noticed the putty. So, um, you also have him looking around, right? And he finds these little pellets, right? It says here on page three. This small pellet is, I presume, the black doughy bass you spoke of? Roughly pyramidal in shape and hollowed out, I perceive. As you say, there appears to be grains of sawdust in it. Dear B, this is very interesting. And the cut, a positive tear, I see. It began with a thin scratch and ended in a jagged hole. I am much indebted to you for directing my attention to this case, Mr. Soames. Where does this door lead to? Right, so he finds these little bits of putty with some sawdust in it. Right, and he also finds the not just in the office, but also in the professor's bedroom. Right, let's see here, where he says, "Hello, what's this?" It was a small pyramid of black putty-like stuff, exactly like the one upon the table of the study. Holmes held it out on his open palm in the glare of the electric light. Right, so what he's doing there is well. He's a detective, right? So these, this is him gathering clues, right? So he's gathering up some clues that he can use in order to, well, solve the case. All right, so that is sort of the other aspect of his um, investigation here, right? So you've got, on one hand, interrogation, and then... On the other hand, you've got uh, investigation, right? So those two things together are what Holmes seems to be doing as he uh, is looking into uh, this case. Okay, before you listen to this next part, you need to have read the story, all right? Because we're uh, about to talk about the ending, right? And this is a Sherlock Holmes story. It's a mystery. You need to experience that for yourself, right? You want to get the Sherlock Holmes experience properly. So if you have not read the story, go read it now. Don't listen to the rest of the video. But if you have, listen to the rest of the video. Okay, so let's see. Spoilers coming in three, two, one. So in the end, Sherlock Holmes talks to these students, right? He talks to 
Gilchrist. Uh, he tries to talk to uh, Dalit, and he also tries to talk to um, Miles, right? Though Miles refuses to talk to him. And as you were reading, I hope you guys were picking up some of the small details that Holmes really focuses on. You'll notice, for instance, that he always asks about height, right? He says, can you tell me his exact height, right? Looking at how tall people are, right? And it all comes down to the end where we find out that, well, our culprit is not the Indian student who was having trouble with Greek, and it wasn't the irresponsible guy either. It was Gilchrist, right? The good scholar and the rugby athlete, right? The one that the professor actually quite liked was the one who did this. So, um, first of all, let's look at how he uh, exposes him, right? Uh, he first talks to uh, Bannister, right? Who is the servant who refuses to uh, tell him anything, right? This is on page six. Uh, Holmes says, Now, Bannister, will you please tell us the truth about yesterday's incident? The man turned white to the roots of his hair. I have told you everything, sir. Nothing to add? Nothing at all, sir. Well, then I must make some suggestions to you. When you sat down on that chair yesterday, did you not... Did you do so in order to conceal some object which would have shown who had been in the room? Bannister's face was ghastly. No, sir, certainly not. It is only a suggestion, Holmes said, said Holmes suavely. I frankly admit that I am unable to prove it, but it seems probable enough, since the moment that Mr. Soames' backs was turned, you release the man who is hiding in that bedroom. Bannister licked his dry lips. There was no man, sir. Ah, that's a pity, Bannister. Up to now you have spoken the truth, but now I know that you have lied. The man's face set in sullen defiance. There was no man, sir. Come, come, Bannister. No, sir, there was no one. In that case, you can give us no further information. Would you please remain in the room? Stand over there near the bedroom door. Now, Soames, I am going to ask you to have great kindness to go up to the room of young Gilchrist and to ask him to step down into yours. So, the servant has clearly done something, and Holmes knows it, right? But he isn't talking, right? And he does a little trick here at the end, right? Which is a typical Holmes thing to do. An instant later, the tutor returned, bringing with him the student, who is a fine figure of a man, tall, lithe, and agile, with a springy step and a pleasant open face. His troubled blue eyes glanced at each of us and finally rested with an expression of blank dismay upon Bannister in the farther corner. Just close the door, said Mr. Holmes. Now, Mr. Gilchrist, we are all quite alone here, and no one need ever know one word of what passes between us. We can be perfectly frank with each other. We want to know, Mr. Gilchrist, how you, an honorable man, ever came to commit such an action as that of yesterday. The unfortunate young man staggered back and cast a full look of horror and reproach at Bannister. No, no, Mr. Gilchrist, sir. I never said a word. Never one word cried the servant. No, but you have now. So, you see what Holmes did there, right? He made it look like uh, Gilchrist, uh, that Bannister has talked, and Gilchrist like sort of looked at him like, you talked. And then, of course, uh, Bannister panicked and said, I didn't say anything. And then Holmes said, well, now you have, right? So he sort of tricks him into it there. Now, Holmes goes through the details here uh, in the last bit, and, uh, you know, in the end, they do decide uh, to forgive him. By the way, Rhodesia, the place he's going, was the old term for South Africa, so that's a whole other story. Those of you who might have South African notes uh, might understand that, you know, maybe Gilchrist wasn't actually a very good person because he was going to the apartheid regime, but that's a whole other issue. We, we won't worry about apartheid here. Uh, the whole thing is that Holmes has solved the case, right? He has, uh, cornered the Gilchrist, and Gilchrist has to confess, and, well, he's now done his job. So, let's go back to our question from yesterday. So, 
the question from yesterday was explain how Sherlock Holmes solves this case. What is his method and how does he figure it out? Right. So I've gone through a couple of the points here. I didn't go through everything that would take forever uh, in uh, this lecture here. Right. How he looks at the um, little things, the putty on the ground and how he interrogates people. Right. Those are two parts of it. So, again, when you answer this question, I don't want you to go through every single thing and say, well, first he talks to Dalit, then he talks to Miles, and Miles doesn't want to talk to him, blah, blah, blah. I don't. Need, it's not a summary. Don't summarize in this answer. Rather, I'm trying to get you guys to explain. Well, the way he solves the case is by, right, what is the method? What's the methodolo methodology, right? Uh... Should I give you guys this hint? Oh, this would maybe be too much. This is sort of giving a, 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 be a little bit away. But there's this word, deduction, right, that uh, I would urge you to consider when you answer that question, right? Deduction is uh, when you take information that you have, uh, not YouTube, you have gathered and you use it to... So I'll use it to make a conclusion, right? So his whole thing does, well, think about that word, right? When you are thinking about how Sherlock Holmes does what he does, right? Because I want you guys to get this part down, right? Before we uh, move on to our novel, which is going to be a much longer Sherlock Holmes story. Right? We should at least understand how Sherlock Holmes operates and what kind of, well, uh, reasoning he uses. Okay, so in your answer, think about that word deduction and think about the way Sherlock Holmes is doing things. All right, so uh, that's what I would say for that particular question. Of course, you guys can ask me questions. And again, I do hope you guys are enjoying the Sherlock Holmes because, again, Sherlock Holmes is awesome. By the way, by the way, um, did you guys manage to solve the case before the ending of the story, right? Which one of the characters did you guys think it was? So, if you got it right, go ahead and post in the comment below and say you got it right. If you got it wrong, you can post that too. How about you? Did you get it right? Meow. Yes, I got it right. I knew it was Gilcrest because he smelled kind of weird. Hmm, okay. You can't smell through a book, but good job, Uranus. So if you guys managed to solve the case before uh, getting to the end, good job, and feel free to post a comment bragging about it. So, uh, again, Monday is Eid, so I will not be posting a video then, but I will, uh, I'll try to post the next story before um, the end, though, right? So, so that you guys can at least get started. So uh, post something below about whether you solved it or not, and I will see you guys on Tuesday. Have a wonderful weekend, and for those of you in the class who are Muslim, Eid Mubarak. Meow. Eid Mubarak. Take care, guys.